Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And also by the generous support of listeners like you, who choose to support us at Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the cyclist was solitary, the bachelor was noble, and the resident was patient, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? On which three continents did Watson have experience of women? When did 221B Baker Street first get telephone service? And why does Holmes prefer telegrams over writing? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 268, The Politician, the Lighthouse, and the Trained Cormorant. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, I'm trying to figure out, if I had to choose from a lineup, which are you, the politician, the lighthouse, or the trained cormorant? I'm that shady guy. I'm number four. You know, the guy with the coat collar turned up and a little, little three-day beard and hat down over his eyes who's looking shiftily at his shoes and trying to avoid attention. The warner's turning his face slightly to the back. Oh, wait, he's gone. That that sounds like the politician. <laughs> oh, well, maybe. <laughs> I, I think you're right. I waive consecutive translation, Senator. I think you're right. Oh, boy. Well, welcome back to Trifles. This is the show of the month when we do a series called uh, Master's Class, where we look at a piece of Sherlockian scholarship that is particularly noteworthy. That really helps us understand how certain Sherlockians have gone about this craft that we call the game. And we will be getting to that in just a moment. First, we wanted to remind you that this episode is available at ihose.co slash trifles268. That is all lowercase. That'll take you directly to the Sherlock Holmes podcast.com website where you can find links and other notes that we'll have that are pertinent to this particular episode. We thank you for your support as patrons. Uh, for as little as a dollar a month, you can support the show and help us to continue to do this research and put the time in that takes us away from our sad, wretched lives. In the meantime, uh, if you would like to leave us a comment, you can do so by email, by emailing us at trifles at I hear of Sherlock.com. You can call us on the phone at 5-1895-221-B-5. Perfect number. Five bookended either side of 1895-221-B. And, of course, if you'd simply like to email us an MP3 file, if you want to record into your phone and then shoot that to us as an attachment, that works, too. Uh, love to have your comments. And speaking of comments, Bert, we should note that we did get a comment in from a listener about our episode regarding the Luca Code. Remember, we did uh, an episode, I think it was 263, we looked at the Red Circle. And yes. we, we picked out a piece, uh, I think it was Don Yates did a piece about the Luca Code. Well, we got a, um, we got a comment, which I was not expecting. A comment from Eric Scase, I believe. And he wanted to call out something that was bothering him with regard to this episode. Remember, we, we noted that um, the the uh, Italian alphabet is different than the English alphabet. It was missing a letter K. And he said, Ex according to my extremely limited understanding, the native Italian alphabet lacks several letters, J, K, W, X, and Y, all of which are considered foreign consonants, leaving 21. 
And Eric continues, to determine how Italians dealt with alphabetizing in the 19th century, I looked at this Italian-English-French dictionary of 1855, in which H is not listed as a letter at the start of a word, even though it gets used in modern 19th century writing. Uh, after I comes L. J and K are not present in the list of I words. An I followed by at least some vowels, like an E or U, is represented by a J, as in uh, Jamale for winter, but Iota. Not being a speaker of Italian, I can't tell you if this was a 19th century convention that has changed in more recent times. Similarly, words beginning with U, sometimes with V before a vowel, uh, Vivido and Volcano being listed in the U section. In cases of the embedded V, the alphabetizing sequence appears to be T, V, Z. So, Atenta would not have been Oyuena, that's A-U-U-E-N-U-A, but Avepa, A-V-V-E-P-V-A. Avepa is far more pronounceable, but it is, of course, a trifle. Well, see, what Eric is, is forgetting there is Avepa was a brand of an early competitor to Vespa. And it was a scooter that uh, no one liked very much. And there were also traffic accidents, so that couldn't be used. Well, hence the use of Atenta for uh, yes. traveling in traffic. <laughs> well, so. or, camp, or camping. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Atenta, let's turn our attention to this particular episode, shall we? But thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Yes. So today we're taking a look at a magnificent paper by one of the world's great Sherlockians, Nick Utekin, who for decades from his pen has flowed the most interesting, among the most interesting and challenging Sherlockian scholarship in the world. And this is The Politician, The Lighthouse, and The Trained Cormorant. Uh, which appeared in the Sherlock Holmes Journal, Volume 26, Number 3, 2003. And I think this was reprinted in The Grand Game, am I thinking? Yeah, it was, it was reprinted in two places, The Grand Game, Volume 2, and occasionally to embellish some writings right. on Sherlock Holmes. And those are from the BSI Press and Wessex Press, <laughs> respectively. We'll have a link to both of those in the show notes. And there's so much to enjoy here. Nick begins by saying, the adventure of the politician, the lighthouse, and the trained cormorant is just about the most famous Sherlock Holmes story, never written up by Dr. Watson. And the lovely part of this is, he goes right to the start and says, you know, let's take a look at the opening of The Veiled Lodger here, which is, of course, where the reference comes from. And... He quotes in his terrific paper a long paragraph that Watson uses to start off his record of the case. By, and Watson recounts the vast amount of material that he has at his disposal to choose from uh, when he reports the cases of Sherlock Holmes. But he uh, ends that paragraph, Watson does, by saying, I deprecate, however, in the strongest way, the attempts which have been made lately to get at and to destroy these papers. The source of these outrages is known, and if they are repeated, I have Mr. Holmes's authority for saying that the whole story concerning the politician, the lighthouse, and the trained cormorant will be given to the public, and there is at least one reader who will understand. Ooh. And then we go off into uh, you know the case of, of the Veiled Lodger. But here it is, and, and the lovely part about Nick's approach here is, of course, he immediately separates the case of the Veiled Lodger, which most chronologists believe took place around about October of 1896, with the publication of the Veiled Lodger, which was published in the Strand Magazine in February of 1927. And Nick um, uses this... Um, to highlight this word in, in Watson's introduction there, where Watson says, the attempts which have been made lately to get at and destroy these papers. After all, a series of other cases preceded the publication of The Veiled Lodger in the Strand. And Watson did not mention it when those cases appeared. But now, 
in February 1927, when the Veiled Lodger is appearing, Watson says lately. So this helps us place in time the um, the attempts to destroy the papers. And um, you know, Nick also in his introduction says, you know, when the subject of this comes up in general Holmesian conversation, one remembers the title itself, The Politician, The Lighthouse, The Train Cormoran, ruminates briefly on how the earth, how on earth these three elements could possibly be connected and move on. And of course, that is his departure point for this uh, paper. Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting that Nick would would turn his attention to, dare we say it, this trifle, um, because the politician, the lighthouse, and the trained cormorant, this is probably the second most recognized unpublished case. Remember a couple of uh, seasons ago, we did a series on unpublished cases. And, and last season, we did a series on exotic animals. And we covered the cormorant in the exotic animals. Um, of course, the giant rat of Sumatra, another unpublished case, and another uh, exotic animal, is probably the most famous of the unpublished cases. But the focus is always on that three object phrase, not on the of late. Uh, and, and I think Nick is right to uh, kind of pick that apart and understand what was going on in society in late 1926 with regard to politics versus what was going on in society and politics in 1896. You know, and understanding that this introduction, this preface would have been written by Watson in preparation for the publication of the story. It's a, it's a really interesting nuance. And this is the jumping off point that Nick begins to do his masterful work from. And it is masterful because he sums all that up by saying, let's take it as read that the foiled intrusions to it, the attempts to destroy these papers happened around Christmas 1926. And now let's take this trail back to its logical origins by putting ourselves in the minds of those who attempted to destroy the document. A minimum of one person was involved because Watson says there's at least one reader who will understand and the main individual involved in the case was indisputably a politician, and he was implicated deeply in the official scandal. And incidentally, official is a most unusual word to use in this context, and must mean, as Nick is about to prove, that the person concerned was himself an official of some sort. And Nick leads us to the conclusion that we're being drawn inexorably when we look to the riddle of these events towards the summer of 1926. Now, here's an area where Nick can turn to some amazing research that he happens to have at his elbow. Um, He says to us, you know, I promise you with every fiber of my being that I had written all of this, everything I just told you, before I happened to turn to, the, to page 17 of the fifth edition of British Political Facts, 1900 to 1979, compiled by David Butler together with Anne Sloman, published by Macmillan in 1980. And this book includes full lists naming all members of all administrations during the period covered. And that, that brings us to the administration of the conservative government headed by Stanley Baldwin from November 1924 to June 1929. And he goes down the list, and there's some famous names. There's certainly Winston Churchill as uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, young Neville Chamberlain in the Department of Health, etc. But but as he goes down the list, he, he gets to more of the, the workhorses within the administration, the undersecretaries, the parliamentary secretaries. And toward the bottom of the list, he, he says, we find a most extraordinary coincidence of dates and events. A certain Walter Elliott had become parliamentary secretary at the Scottish office in charge of health for Scotland at the start of the administration. But then, in the middle of the summer, July 1926, that post was abolished. The word is there, plain as the proverbial pike staff, Nick says. And uh, Mr. Elliot immediately becomes, on the very same day, the undersecretary at the Scottish office, which 
My goodness, that was a promotion. So his position was eliminated, and he was promoted. And Nick went back and double-checked, and there were uh, six junior posts that were uh, abolished from government in the immediate aftermath of the First World War. Um, but uh, aside from that, uh, e- exactly at a time when previously proven logic, he writes, demanded that political scandal took place, a junior government minister is moved and promoted and his previous post is abolished. Thereafter, the concept of a minister with responsibility for, quote-unquote, health of Scotland is no uh, no longer existed. So he said the fact of Elliot's promotion is, of course, pivotal here. The classic cover-up was being put in place. An official scandal of some sort had taken place involving Mr. Elliot, knowledge of which the public was to be denied. And it must have involved the health of Scotland, else why abolish that particular post? And we will get into those details after this word from our healthy sponsor. When you're looking for reference material regarding the Sherlock Holmes stories, the Baker Street Journal has been providing thoughtful articles since 1946. The topics range from the trifling to deep conundrums, but they all center around Sherlockian scholarship. And maybe you've been subscribing for years, or maybe you have yet to subscribe. But there's one resource that can make your research easier to do, the EBSJ. The EBSJ is an electronic copy of all the back issues of the Baker Street Journal from its inception in 1946 through 2011 in PDF format. That's 276 issues with more than 18,000 pages spanning the old series to the new series, the Christmas annuals all the way through 2011. It's entirely searchable so you can find what you need in just seconds. Check out the EBSJ on BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. All right, we're back, and we were just beginning to learn about Walter Elliott. Yes, and Nick takes us through his career, and we go through the various governments, uh, the Baldwin administration falls in 1929 and so on. But Elliott turns up as financial secretary to the Treasury, another promotion, and then this is in the 1930s now, and then but a year later, on the 28th of September, 1932, he became Minister for Agriculture and Fisheries. Fisheries. Huh. And three years on, in June 1935, he enters the cabinet in this role, and then he becomes Scottish Secretary, and then his last governmental position is Health Secretary in May 1938, and by the time the 1940 coalition government comes in, he's gone. And Nick says, you know, it's tragic that over 60 years later, aspersions have to be cast on an apparently honorable and successful politician, but the logic is inexorable. It is indeed. So so this is our politician. We're talking about the politician, the lighthouse, and the trained cormorant. How do we manage to get ourselves a lighthouse after this? Nick says, take a look at the year 1926. It seems that at that time there were some 193 lighthouse sites around the craggy coast and islands of Scotland. And he can't be absolutely sure all 193 were... Uh, still active. And he has a lovely little side note here. He says, you know, I would have loved for their names alone to have researched Kumluwik Ness on Shetland or Inchkeith and Lothian. But there was an obvious starting point and, as it turned out, an obvious finishing point. The Northern Lighthouse Board was based at Oban in Argyle on the wild western coast, battered by the Atlantic. It had been there since the 1780s. And the commissioners of Northern Lighthouses in Oban, to give the office its full title, performed and still performs the same task for Scotland and the Isle of Man as does Trinity House for England and Wales. It oversaw all lighthouses in its jurisdiction. It's always been government run, and there was a lighthouse in Oban. Ah, and and there was uh, this this lighthouse in Oban, um, a mere twenty five miles north of the Oban lighthouse, was Castle Stalker, 
which was uh, built and uh, well built in the 1500s, abandoned around 1780. Um, but in the 1920s, it was ruined. And Nick asked, well, why should we possibly be interested in this? The castle stands at the mouth of Loch Lake on a small rocky islet. The islet is known far and wide as the Rock of the, wait for it, Cormorants. The Rock of the Cormorants. We are very nearly there, and the full story is very nearly revealed, Nick writes. Walter Elliott was for 18 months in charge of health of Scotland, so something, Nick says, occurred before the 26th of July, 1926, that involved the winged inhabitants of the Rock of the Cormorants. An open lighthouse that was so serious a government post had to be abolished and a cover-up put in place. Hmm. Only some 90 miles to the north of Oban, 65 miles therefore north of Castle Stalker, is the uninhabited island of Grunard, that drear and lonely place which was revealed some years ago as having been the site where anthrax bombs were deliberately dropped for experimental purposes during the Second World War. Is it ridiculous to suggest that something similar was tried with disastrous results in preceding years? I think not. Anthrax had existed for years. Louis Pasteur had discovered an anti-anthrax vaccine in 1881. And the Scottish estate incorporating Grunard was purchased by the family which still owns it in, now you're not going to believe this, Nick says, the year 1926. So all the pieces of the jigsaw are now in place. This is this is lovely. This is really a, a workmanlike piece that Nick is putting together. So so we have the lighthouse, we have the politician, and, and the rock of cormorants. I think really is pointing us in that direction. He says um, he, he says we must take it there was some disaster of some sort with anth- anthrax spreading where it should not have uh, horrific deaths among the local population. The killer outbreak needed to be contained, et cetera, et cetera. A cover-up was ordered from Whitehall through Elliot. Removing the dead bodies was easy. Paramount, the anthrax spores had to disappear. Now, not even the most highly trained of cormorants can capture individual spores, but here is the most important element in this cunning plan. The original anthrax experiment had involved the noxious substances being introduced into fish. When it was discovered that matters had got seriously out of hand, the viciously dangerous fish were collected, fed into the expandable pouches beneath the beaks of cormorants. And what is it that these birds do best? Why, they're capable of diving to extraordinary depths to catch fish. Well, in this case, the training that we know about, train them to to do precisely the opposite, to dive deeply and release or disgorge their poisonous cargo. But not into the seas off Grunard. No, no, no. They flew 90 miles south, far away from the disaster site, toward their goal, the Oban Lighthouse. As its (laughs) beam flashed to a specific pattern, the cormorant shot straight down into the murky depths of the North Atlantic. Ownership of Grenard was transferred, and Elliot and the government thought they were in the clear. But the health of Scotland had been appallingly compromised. The government position was abolished, and Elliot promoted out of danger. (laughs) We cannot know for certain how Sherlock Holmes, then in 19... 26, and well into retirement at the age of 72, came to hear of the details and more significantly gained possession of the secret documents drawn up about the whole affair. And perhaps they arrived via a leak from a worried Whitehall civil servant. It may be that a relative of one of the dead of Grunard happened upon them. After abortive efforts to get at and destroy the papers, Elliot, and perhaps some far higher than he, took note of Watson's hugely public warning at the start of The Veiled Lodger, and the situation was contained. And then Nick has just two postscripts. He says, first, six years after the disaster, Elliot was given a government role that specifically covered Great Britain's fisheries policy, cormorant control, and an emphatic resolution never to permit exploration of the waters around Oban Lighthouse would have been high on his agenda. 
And his second note is, you know, at the end of this, he says, I must thank a friend and colleague of mine. He says, Mark Jones, for providing the link essential to the thrust of this article. Because over a drink in the Yorkshire Gray near Broadcasting House, when I spoke of government cover-ups and Scottish health, he merely had to whisper one word into my ear. Anthrax. <laughs> Not Norbury this time. Anthrax. Well, what, what a workmanlike piece uh, this is. I mean, this just shows how wonderful the pursuit of the game can be if we allow ourselves a little imagination and if we have at our fingertips uh, certain reference books to f- supply us with facts uh, this is exactly what we would hope for in great scholarship in the future and it's it's what we hope for in the master's class and that is just another episode of trifles it is of course a trifle but there is nothing so important as trifles Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. In the channel... A foghorn wailed like a lost soul. Holmes, what's the point of all this meandering? First up one dilapidated alley, then down the next. I'm frozen to the bone. Let's get home before someone slits our throats from behind. Nice trick if it can be done, Watson. No, a stab in the back, or perhaps a bit of thuggy with a fine silken cord would be more in keeping with this neighborhood. What's the good of all this prowling about? But, Watson, we promised Mrs. Hudson we'd bring her some tea. 